gentlemen. Uh, Can I please have your attention? Dear listeners, this is Jonah Goldberg, host of the Remnant Podcast, brought to you by the Dispatch and Dispatch Media. It is 9.18 a.m., so I'm getting started. I can't tell if it's a little late or a little early. On Friday morning, I feel like I'm kind of a weird sort of in-between world because um, I've been so busy for the last and so stressed for the last, like, well, a long time, but at least it more intensely in the last couple of weeks. And then um, last couple of days have been just crazy hectic with all sorts of weird uh, pressures, including I had to get this uh, review of Patrick Deneen's book done for the Acton Institute. And I just, I needed time to actually be alone with it. Uh, you know, there, there's certain kinds of writing that you just can't do in bits and pieces. Um, and I don't do bits and pieces writing very well at all anyway, but this is not an interesting conversation. So let's change gears. Um, one of the reasons why I'm sort of out of it is that, so my wife, uh, for her birthday, um, is going with her best friend from college to Amsterdam to see the Vermeer exhibit, which I'm very jealous of. And then from there, she's going to go back to Slovakia to do some um, more research on the uh, book she's writing about her dad. And so I am alone with the quadrupeds. And this morning I hear this, I can't really do the sound, but um, I open my eyes at around 520 in the morning and there is the spaniel, Pippa, staring at me and these sounds are coming from the spaniel um they're very clearly electronic and they're coming from the spaniel and i'm groggy and uh confused and it's you know it's the sound that uh air tags make when you're looking for a lost item kind of thing and i forgot that we actually have air tags in the dog's collars now and it had this weird kind of like, as I'm still like more than two thirds asleep, kind of like assassination attempt feel to it. Like the dog was going to explode um, because, and this was the sound of the remote detonator being triggered, that bleep down sound. And it kind of freaked me out and it really freaked out Pippa. But the thing that, you know, Pippa was already kind of freaked out because her neck had just started making electronic sounds like a little bird or something. So, uh, much, much confusion and mayhem. And, uh, um, I don't know why my wife would activate the air tag thing. Um, because they're key to her phone for reasons I disagree with, but there you have it. And, uh, so that was just a weird way to start the morning. So the whole timeline is off. I, um, um, I walked the dog super early, um, and uh, here we are. So, where to begin? So, uh, uh, last week, last Saturday night, well, I'll, I'll save that stuff for later, the stuff about my mom. Um, maybe I'll just wait until Mother's Day to do something. But, so the, the thing I'm kind of excited about is, and the morning dispatch is about it, is um, there's this Supreme Court case that is that I guess they heard oral arguments this week that could deal a fairly devastating blow to the administrative state. I think, you know, we hear so much about the deep state and all these kinds of things. And it's a very frustrating thing for me because what has, what, what, what the sort of paranoid populist right has turned the deep state into is not what the deep state historically is. I mean, I, th I think the original term for the deep state comes from Turkey and it had to do with, you know, politics that have nothing to do with, with the United States. But people off, people now use sort of the administrative state and the deep state interchangeably. Um, and the problem is, is that the, the garbagey paranoia about, you know, 
various conspiracy theories from, you know, star chambers deep within the bowels of the deep state um, has spilled over into conversation about the administrative state. And the administrative state is like a real thing. There's a lot of administrative law. There are a lot of books about this stuff. Uh, My friend and colleague at AEI, Adam White, is one of the foremost experts on this stuff. Um, He's, there's this guy, Philip Hamburger, who wrote um, a really great book called Is Administrative Law Lawful? And um, uh, my friend and also a colleague, or I guess he's colleague emeritus now, Charles Murray wrote this whole book called By the People about the problems with the administrative state. And the thing is, is at the end of the day, you know, the administrative state, if all you mean by it is a bunch of bureaucrats that have a certain amount of uh, freedom to do the jobs well, um, there's really not that much to complain about the administrative state. The problem is, is that's not what it's become. The administrative state has become um, a separate, um, it's basically like the fourth branch of government. At least that's what some people call it. I, I wrote I have a long chapter about it in Suicide of the West, um, um, which I should have read before doing this and or reread before doing this. Um, but the, 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 the core problem is, is that you know, there was this famous Chevron case, which basically says that um, when people are suing the government, when they're suing about uh, specific regulations put forward, promulgated by the, um, you know, by government officials, um, career civil servants, bureaucrats, agency heads, that kind of thing, um, that Barring something really sort of egregious, um, the courts are just simply going to defer to the judgment of the bureaucrats or certainly to the judgment of the administrative processes and laws of 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 the bureaucracy of the various regulatory agencies. Um, and uh, this has sort of evolved to the point where you now basically have a different set of law covering regulators and, and administrators and bureaucrats than that covers everybody else. I mean, there are literally different kinds of trials, different kinds of courtrooms, different kinds of judge, different kinds of presumptions of guilt and innocence. It is a completely parallel um, and government favoring, bureaucrat favoring um, system of government. And, you know, there's a reason why this guy, Philip Hamburger, wrote this great book, you know, uh, Is Administrative Law Lawful? Is that there's a, like, if you just explained it to a normal person, right, who didn't understand that, there, you know, this precedent led to that precedent and this is how we got to this and here's the connective tissue making this make sense. And instead you just showed someone the final result of how the administrative state and how administrative law works. And you just explained it to them basically. Be as long as they actually understood what like the constitution is and what democracy is, they would say, that's crazy. It's just crazy. There's just a whole different body of law and expectations for government bureaucrats than there is for every other sphere of, of public life. And then you add in the fact that the administrative state becomes possible, becomes what it is because Congress failed to do its job. And I know I'm a broken record on the whole Congress isn't doing what Congress is supposed to do thing, but Congress is broken because it isn't doing what it's supposed to do. This, you know, this goes back to the Wilson administration and, and, you know, Wilson was a huge fan of the administrative state. He's a huge architect of the administrative state. Um, He had this, you know, view that, you know, he has this long extended metaphor, if memory serves, you know, not everybody can be involved in the cooking of food. So it's silly to put some questions up for a vote instead, you know, um, or even have Congress get involved. You need a cook in the kitchen who has free reign to manage the, the stove and the timing and all of these kinds of things. It's a great analogy, you know, or at least I remember it being a good analogy. And it's persuasive to a certain extent. I mean, like when you think about like a general on the battlefield, you don't want everybody sort of 
uh, second guessing and screwing and getting there, screwing with his plans and all that kind of stuff. But it's gotten wildly out of hand. And in the process, what has happened is, is that the sort of the, the bureaucrats and the mandarins of the administrative state are given what Edmund Burke or John Locke would have called arbitrary power, which the whole system of checks and balances and constitutionalism that we have in this country, as well as sort of the common law constitutionalism stuff from the UK, is set up against the idea of arbitrary power. Arbitrary power just basically means what it sounds like. It is um, that rulers can rule by whim without uh, regard to the law, um, without regard to the um, will of the people. They just get to do what they want. And um, Congress uh, has basically made that possible by basically saying, eh, we, we kind of want to do this and we kind of want to do that. Um, but, you know, let the cabinet secretaries figure out what to do, what rules to make, all these kinds of things. I found... Um, the chapter from Suicide of the West on this. Let me just read for a little bit while I figure out what the hell I'm talking about. This is from the book. For the most part, Congress no longer makes laws the way the founders intended. They outsource the heavy lifting to the, bu to the bureaucracy. This was already true when James Burnham published The Managerial Revolution, one of the first seminal works on the subject, in 1941. Uh, quote, Laws today in the United States, in fact, most laws are not being made any longer by Congress, Burnham wrote, quote, but by the NLR, NLRB, SEC, ICC, AAA, TVA, FTC, FCC, the Office of Production Management, uh, what a revealing title, and the other leading executive agencies. How well lawyers know this to be the case. That's all a quote from Burnham. And then I write, consider the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. Journalist Philip Klein, not then with National Review, but now, uh, dived into the fine print and found that, and this is a long quote from Phil, there are more than 2,500 references to the Secretary of Health and Human Services in the health care law. This is, he was writing this back when Obamacare was, you know, first a fresh thing. Says So there are 2,500 references to the Secretary of Health and Human Services and the health care law. In most cases, she's simply mentioned as the secretary. A further breakdown finds that there are more than 700 instances in which the secretary is instructed that she, quote, shall do something, and more than 200 cases in which she, quote, may take some form of regulatory action if she chooses. On 139 occasions... The law mentions decisions that the secretary determines, quote unquote. At times, the frequency of these mentions reaches comic heights. For instance, one section of the law reads, quote, each person to whom the secretary provided information under subsection D shall report to the secretary in such manner as the secretary determines appropriate. And that's, now this is me again. It is impossible to quantify the discretion, i.e. arbitrary power, Congress bestowed on the HHS secretary. Quote, either the new powers and responsibilities given to the secretary are too complicated for even HHS to figure out, Klein writes, or they are so arbitrary that uh, then healthcare secretary Catherine Sebelius can pick and choose how she'll comply with parts of the law, unquote. But this is me again. But this merely scratches the surface of the administrative state. Whole agencies are independent of political control, which is very different from saying they are independent from politics. Consider just one example. According to the Constitution, only Congress can levy a tax. This is not some merely procedural nicety. It is a concrete expression of the founders' core conviction that taxation must be legitimized by representation. That, after all, was the crux of their argument with King George. And that is why Article 1 of the Constitution requires, quote, that all bills for raising revenue shall originate in the House of Representatives, a.k.a. the People's Chamber. 
But Congress has grown comfortable relinquishing this power. In 1919 and 1996, the Federal Communications Commission was granted the authority to raise taxes as it sees fit. The Universal Service Fund started as a tax on long-distance phone calls, originally set at 3%. Within a decade, the quote-unquote fee reached 11%, all absent, absent congressional approval. During the Obama administration, the FCC had moved towards imposing a similar tax on broadband internet services, in part because revenue had fallen off due to people abandoning landlines. The revenues ostensibly go to paying for expanded access to internet, to the internet in rural areas, areas and providing computers for poor schools and libraries. But there have also been numerous scandals in which the monies were poorly spent, misallocated, and sluiced to politically connected players. So anyway, I go on and on and on about other examples of this kind of stuff. Oh, let me read just this one last thing. This is an excerpt from Charles Murray's uh, By the People. Just explaining how fakakta the administrative state really is. If you are prosecuted for violating a regulation issued by the EPA, OSHA, HHS, Department of Energy, or any of the myriad other federal ag regulatory agencies, you appear before an administrative law judge, or ALJ, sitting in an administrative law courtroom. An ALJ is selected by the agency who he, whose case, cases he will hear and is subsequently an employee of that agency. The agency gets to choose its preferred candidate from among the three top-rated candidates identified by the Office of Personnel Management. An administrative law judge is exempt from performance reviews and other oversight by the regulatory agency, but may be overruled by the head of the agency. There's no jury. When appearing in an administrative court, you do not get a lawyer unless you pay for it. Most rules of evidence used in normal courts do not apply. The legal burden of proof placed on the lawyer making the case for the regulatory agency is, quote, a preponderance of the evidence, not clear and convincing evidence, let alone evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that you are guilty. If the administrative judge thinks that it is a 51-49% call in favor of the regulatory agency that accused you, you're found guilty. If the administrator of the administrative court judge's decision is adverse, you may, in most cases, appeal that decision to another body within the agency. So anyway, the point is, is these, these, Bureaucratic agencies, these administrative agencies, these regulatory agencies are essentially lawmaking and they are not elected. They are not accountable to voters. There's no real transparency that goes into it. They are sort of a, a rogue branch of government. I'm not saying everything they do is bad or wrong or anything like that, but given how uh, most of the, you know, mainstream media that has the resources to cover anything like, you know, regulatory agencies are generally in favor of more and expanded government. You can see how uh, this stuff just simply grows like kudzu. And so there's this case before the court um, where, uh, I don't know, the U Fish and Wildlife Service, somebody wants to put uh, monitors on boats on fishing boats that the uh, owners of the boats will have to pay for to supervise how they fish. And this is seen by a lot of people as a possible key test case for um, reining back, you know, the regulatory state. And I don't know why I'm spending so much time on this, but I just find it interesting. And also I just think it, this gets to a larger point. Um, I think a lot of our political problems in America are the product of a lack of self-government. And self-government is one of these broad, kind of opaque, um, multiply interpretable, um, diversely interpretable word for phrases, right? Because the self-government mean um, democracy, you know, like just on a national scale and a local scale, or does it mean Self-government in terms of like local communities um, taking care of themselves without looking to Washington, or does it actually mean sort of what it says in the you know what is in the in, in the 
with the, in the national anthem with Star Spangled Banner, you know, confirm thy soul in self control. Is it is it self government about taking your own responsibilities seriously? And um, I don't care which version of it you mean. I think that the a lot of our problems come from the idea that everybody thinks somebody else can do it, right? I think this is a problem in families where, particularly with husbands, kids who think that, you know, they're not supposed to do their part. I think it's a problem in communities. I think it's a problem um, at every level, at scale, right? I mean, I just talked about how the administrative state gets created because Congress doesn't want to do its job. Because the executive branch doesn't really want to do, I mean, all right, I shouldn't say the executive branch because these guys are part of the executive branch. Um, the White House doesn't want to do its job. These guys like farming these things out to bureaucracies, to other agencies, and then just sort of say, ah, my hands are tied. It's not my job. And um, uh, I think one of the ways you actually get people to take their rep- responsibilities seriously is to give them the responsibilities. Um, and I bring it up all the time about, you know, the, the, all these VA scandals where they happen, you know, every few years and they're always outrageous and disgusting um, with either sort of incompetence, corruption, neglect um, involved. And uh, the response from Congress is that everybody is outraged, right? Everybody is, is can't believe this, this could happen. The White House is outraged. The media is outraged. Well, you know, you, this was your job to oversee this stuff, right? This was your job to uh, make sure that vets were taken care of properly. And yet these things happen over and over and over again. And I think it's uh, this ability to be outraged when things go bad because you have no actual political skin in the game is why a lot of these kinds of things go bad. And so that's, I mean, I know... I talk about sending power back to the states and local communities a lot, and I'm, I'm more and more skeptical that we're ever going to be able to do it, um, particularly in an era of national, you know, where the, where the right believes in nationalism. And guess what? Nationalism and federalism are um, antipodal, right? They are conflicting terms. They do not get along. Nationalism and subsidiarity do not get along. And so it's going to take years to get the right to start thinking seriously and clearly and cleverly again about federalism, localism, subsidiarity, however you want to call it. But if you give people the responsibility and therefore they get the praise when they do it right and they get the blame when they do it wrong, and I think this goes as much for raising kids, teach, you know, raising, uh, teaching kids in school, um, to empowering local officials, you give them the responsibility for something and some of them will fail and then they'll get fired. I mean, you're not going to fire your kids, but you get my point. Um, uh, and then people who want the responsibility, you know, winners want the ball, will come in and they'll do the job properly. This is sort of at the heart of, of, of at least not the heart, but it was, it was part of the nuanced argument that I was having with Sarah um, Isger about the... Um, the March and Skokie stuff is when we get so determined to sort of uh, ideologize uh, things like free speech and free association to the point where we have these, we have to have these, these concrete, unflexible um, rules for all circumstances. Um, what we're basically doing is taking the agency out of local officials, local communities, local citizens, right, um, for being able to make these calls, for being able to decide, you know, where, um, where to draw lines. We think we have to draw lines at a national scale. And look, again, I think that the, the right side won the Civil War. I think the Civil Rights Amendments were, were I mean, the Civil War Amendments were necessary and good, um, all that kind of stuff. I am still sympathetic to the idea that incorporating the Bill of Rights the way we have into every state, while good and laudable in most respects, does not come without problems. 
And, you know, I just don't, I have no, I, I just I can't get super worked up about things like local censorship, um, local restrictions on all sorts of things that I would never want the federal government to get into. In part, because I just simply believe that the people closest to a problem are the ones best, best suited to fixing it. And I think too much of our lives is basically being outsourced to other people to make decisions for us. Um, and I think, you know, another player on this, I'll, I'm just going to get off the administrative state stuff because I don't want people falling asleep at the wheel while listening to this podcast while driving. But um, to sort of stay on this broader point, you know, one of the things uh, in all the uh, talk about institutions and, and whatnot that, you know, I do it partly because I've been writing about it for a long time in part because it's, you know, fan service to Yuval Levin, praise be upon him. One of the key things that I, I believe has driven the decline in institutions, both in terms of, when I say institutions, I mean, I don't mean in the economic sense of like rules. Um, I mean, in the way that most people think about the Birkin little platoons, the, the Shriners, your local church, uh, little league, all these kinds of things, bowling leagues, all that stuff, right? The decline in institutions and the really precipitous decline in institution formation. Um, it's, so it's not just that a bunch of institutions are going away. It's that, which has always happened. It's that we're not creating new institutions to fit the needs of Americans. And I think there are a lot of reasons for it, but I'm one of those guys who just really believes that technology drives more cultural change than uh, a lot of people give it credit for. You know, I, I talk about this a lot about how, like, I love ideas. I love intellectual history, but ideas, um, only take you so far. Um, there's a lot of other material forces in life that drive things. And um, as I think I've talked about here before, this was one of the reasons why Whitaker Chambers could never call himself um, a conservative. He called himself a man of the right because he ultimately, ultimately believed that the primary shaper of social forces were the means of production were sort of material technological changes rather than um, simply a bunch of ideas. I mean, the means of production thing also comes, you know, is tight, tightly tied up with sort of economic organization. But that too is deeply tied up with, with technological stuff. And so I think one of the reasons why you get fewer institutions is that technology more and more um, can do the things that you used to need other people to help you do. You know, and the example I always use is, you know, if, if, is uh, when I was in college, um, I was the co-editor of this high school, of the this high school, of the college newspaper. Me and my friend, uh, Andy Gallagher, we had this idea to update the technology of the newspaper and get, you know, one of the early, early-ish, really great desktop publishing Macs. Um, and, you know, Back then, we were using things like PageMaker or whatever. Um, because until then, the, you know, the, the school newspaper had for the preceding, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years, done this stuff with glue sticks and X-Acto knives where you would um, use a very special expensive printer to print out these columns of text. And then you would literally glue them to a big page. And then you take those pages, those proofs, to a printer where they would take a special picture of it and they would print out the broadsheet of the newspaper. And that's how most newspapers work to one extent or another for a very long time. And um, it was inefficient. It was time consuming. It was a pain in the ass. It, the product didn't look good. And we were like, we're going to bring technology. So we got, um, you know, we got the funding to get a computer and we were very proud of ourselves and it looked great and all that kind of stuff. The thing I had no anticipation of was that we kind of ruined, we created, actually we ruined, but we created a massive morale problem at the paper because all of a sudden we went from needing everybody to show up and do their part and we would order pizzas and you'd have, you'd drink sodas and or maybe beer and, um, and you get to know each other, you talk about what to cover and all these kinds of things. And 
um, you'd get an esprit de corps, you get a sort of a camaraderie and because you'd be doing, pulling a late night with a bunch of your colleagues. And all of a sudden, by getting this new technology, people just brought, for some of you kids out there, you may not understand this term, a floppy disk with their copy on it. They handed it off. They gave it to us. We put it into the computer. And then they disappeared because there was no need for them to hang out. And um, I think sort of by analogy, by metaphor, this is where this is the way a lot of institutions die is that the institutions were once necessary um, because of the, the, the need to have a large number of people help out with a project. And now either technology um, solves the problem where you don't have to get off your couch to get the things that you want, right? You don't have to go down to the corner store and talk to the, you know, the guy at the counter when you're getting your newspaper in the morning, right? You don't have to talk to your d- newspaper delivery guy um, or kid or whatever um, because it all just comes to your your phone or your laptop or your tablet. And so the middlemen um, that used to provide this sort of connective tissue and sinew of civil society are slowly being replaced by technology. And the ones not being replaced by literal physical technology, they're being replaced by essentially political technology, by bureaucracies that, um, and social workers, but professionals who siphon off um, the responsibilities that once went to volunteers. One of the best examples of this, anybody who knows, has any experience with um, political ca- campaigns will tell you some version of this story about how um, changes in technology, changes in communications, changes in, in campaign finance law have uh, basically rendered the campaign volunteer not irrelevant, but much less important than it used to, than they used to be. You know, the, the, the old volunteers who would grab yard signs and put them up and, and, and go door to door. Um, that's all been, I mean, I shouldn't say all, a lot of that has been professionalized. And again, it's okay. So it's not bureaucracy, but it's still professionalization, right? It's not just relying on people who have real civic engagement. It's relying on people who get paid a lot of money to collect signatures, to knock on doors, um, to make calls and all that. And uh, it leaves the people who want to be sort of involved in local politics or national politics out of a sense of, of sort of civic or patriotic um, enthusiasm kind of just sitting on the sidelines. And, um, I think these are just small examples of just this larger phenomenon where because of, of, of technology and professionalization and bureaucracy and all these things, we are sort of siphoning off the, the necessity of why institutions get created in the first place. Um, and, you know, necessity still is the mother of invention. So, you know, uh, you know, everyone loves the images or the, 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 the was it Peter Weir who did Witness? Um, the Hollywood version of Amish uh, barn raising. And it does look great. I mean, I love cold fried chicken. So, and picnics and lemonade. Um so, uh, you know, that's all fine, but that's only possible for a community that has very deliberately put limits on technology, obviously, but also on all sorts of governmental, bureaucratic, uh, capitalistic um, um, solutions or, 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 or tools, right? I mean, like, uh, it's a bit of a myth that Amish can't use, like, power tools and all that kind of stuff. You know, they can rent them. They just don't buy them. Um, that's my understanding, at least. But regardless, you know, it's, it, you, you, the barn raising thing is possible in a community that is designed to make things a little harder and as a result, you get more of a sense of community. 
I do not begrudge the Amish at all for the for those sorts of choices. Um, but it's you don't need in a modern advanced economy. You don't need to get forty families and all your friends and relatives together to spend a day raising a barn because we have people to do that. We have tools to do that. Um, and, um, and I, and so I think about this a lot about like, how do we create institutions? You know, you've all always says, you know, look, institutions weren't just created so people could get together and feel like they were part of something. That's not the point of institutions. That's the benefit of institutions. That's the, uh, that's the gravy of institutions. People create institutions to do things, to get things done, whether it's lobbying government to get legislation passed or whether it's, you know, um, to create a, you know, to, to create an opportunity for people to bowl competitively, right? It's the, 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 there's a thing that needs to be um, driving the need to create institutions. And, um, it's it's hard to f- think of what those things are. I mean, you can see why, you know, the people who, you know, like it's weirdly, I, d- I don't like thinking about it this way, but it just occurs to me that like, you know, video games are kind of like institutions today where there's a point to it. It's like a bowling league. It's like a softball league, right? You don't have to get off your couch. You don't actually meet human beings face to face for the most part. Um but there is a sense of community to it. You're talking to other people. You feel like if you're gone for a while and you come back, people are like, hey, where you been? Um, and I find that I personally, maybe just because I'm a crotchety old dude at this point, that that kind of institution building is a poor substitute for the kind of thing that you get off your ass and you actually go into a place and you deal with people in the real world. And you, you know, like I, I think a soup kitchen uh, is better than um, a call of duty chat room, which is not to say that, you know, I mean, the reason why I don't play a lot of those video games is I know I would disappear into them. Oh, but, oh, since I was just talking about chat rooms. Okay. So I wrote my LA times column about this. I like this column. I think this is, um, a very useful way to think about things. Um, it appears up at the dispatch. Now I talked about it a little bit, I guess with Rob long earlier this week on the, on the pod, I'll just sort of summarize very quickly. If you have any experience with online publishing, or if you really have any experience with most common sections, you'll observe pretty quickly that there is something of a Gresham's law of the common section or the Gresham's, Gresham's law of the internet. Um, I'm not the first piece in, person to point out how Gresham's law applies. What Gresham's law is from economics, just so you know, is it's, this, it's basically this aphorism that says, um, bad money crowds out good. And basically it just says that bad money being cheaper and easier to get, um, will push aside good money, which is more expensive and, and harder to get. I'll let Dave Ponson come on and explain Gresham's law when it comes to currency stuff. My point is, is that there's a Gresham's law about comment sections and lots of other things, right? So like in comment sections, you'll find that if you don't do content moderation, editing, right? If you don't warn people, block people, banish people, it's very difficult to keep comment sections from getting really nasty and ugly. And there's this auto catalytic um, process to it, right? So what happens is, let's say you start with 100 people, the universe of people in your comment section is 100 people, and only 5% of them are jerks. And when I mean jerk, I mean that they, they post nasty stuff. They're insulting. They don't read, they don't really listen, so to speak to the other people in the thing. They always leap to the worst conclusions about everybody. Um, sometimes they'll, you know, they'll be vulgar. Um, and they'll post a lot more than like nice people or normal people, right? Because normal people have better things to do than to spend all day saying crappy, mean things about everybody to everybody in a comment section. And so over time, what will happen is 
you know, at the very beginning, the distribution of comments between polite normals and rude um, jerks will be pretty ro- will be pretty well distributed and robust because everybody's giving it a try. But over time, the obnoxious people will drive out the decent people because who's got time to just be insulted and get into arguments that go nowhere because the person you're arguing with refuses to 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 act in good faith. And eventually they crowd out the decent people and they attract more bad people. Well, you know, if you if you tell people, oh, you know, this is what this is what happened to Parlor, right? This is what happened to a lot of these, you know, you know, uh, getter, whatever, these startup uh, macro mega comment section things, which Twitter is one. If you even remotely signal that you can have porn or uh, Holocaust jokes on there, the people who love to post about porn and Holocaust jokes are going to flock to it. And so eventually, not only do the 98, you know, 95% of normals not um, engage uh, in the comments section, they may actually just sort of leave all together um, because the people who start getting attracted to it are the, are, you know, are, it's, it's like they're emptying out the, the bars on Tatooine, which we all know is a hive of scum and villainy. And, and then you get into this problem of the incentive structure of the publisher, which is it's very expensive to police these comment sections. It's very, I don't mean just expensive in terms of money. I mean, expensive in terms of time. And like with anything, if something's expensive in terms of time, eventually you find somebody, just like our previous conversation, to take the time suck away from you and then you pay them money to do it. And so the publishers also get less engaged in it. And um, I think that this is a trend that I don't know anybody who's been involved in the in online publishing in the last two and a half decades who um, doesn't have doesn't basically broadly agree with me that, you know, there are things, if, if you, if you want to have a real conversation in civic discourse in the comment section, you got to ride herd on it to a significant degree. And there were things, you know, like I lobbied for a long time, long before NR plus came into being, I argued for a long time about having like a, a, sec, a, a, a higher tier of, of subscribers who had special privileges, moderating privileges, access privileges um, in the comment sections and elsewhere and all that kind of stuff. Um, but they would have to give us their real names and their credit cards and all that kind of stuff because people tend to be less jerky if you know, if, if they know that people know who they are and that the people in charge actually are holding on to their credit card number. Uh, this is just a very widespread thing. You know, so like uh, Tim Miller over, uh, you know, he's over at the Bulwark. He wrote um, a book. Um, where he talks about how when he was on Jeb Bush's, it's called Why We Did It, uh, when he was on Jeb Bush's campaign as, as Jeb's comms director, you know, they tried really hard to woo Steve Bannon um, and the guys at, 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 at Post Andrew, um, Breitbart.com or Breitbart News. And, um, and it dawned on Tim that the problem was, was that, um, among other things, I mean, there are lots of problems dealing with Steve Bannon, including the smell of sulfur, um, constantly assaulting your nostrils. But uh, the the Bannon's, you know, brilliant breakthrough in terms of Breitbart was to um, not do content moderation, but content extremism, content pandering, where you actually lean into the most engaged commenters the people and you give them what they want you do fan service for them and you attract more and more of them that's why uh bannon said that he wanted breitbart to become the platform for the alt-right you know back then the alt-right if you knew what it was a lot of people didn't know what it was but what it was it was they were the they were the asses who would make the most holocaust jokes and talk about you know um how hitler was on to something and all that kind of thing um they were the ones who put you know the the triple parentheses around Jewish last names. Um, and Bannon knew that. Um, and, you know, he hired that Milo Yiannopoulos jackwad um, to write, you know, like defenses of the alt-right. And, you know, and, and part of the strategic point of that was to tell outsiders 
um, who were a little concerned by what they saw. Oh, don't worry about it. This is all just like deeply ironic, sardonic stuff from from the kids. They're not really Nazis. They just do this to shock people. It's not a big deal. Anyway, the point of the column was, was that the the Gresham's Law of the Commons section has leapt into the meat space. And we can see it as the GOP um, is basically just becoming a giant comment section. Um, what put it in my head was, um, well, first of all, I've been for a long time, I've wanted to write, and I, I need better data on this. And if somebody has it, will you just ping me and point my way to it? I know it's, there's a lot of anecdotal stuff, but there are a lot of people who claim that one of the reasons why Trump's popularity in the GOP is so persistently high is that um, a lot of anti-Trump or never Trump or moderate or independent or, or traditional conservative, whatever label you want to put on it, a lot of normals, that's how I kind of put on it, left the GOP because they want nothing to do with this garbage. And so when you do polling, the only people who are left, by definition, are the ones who have either no problem or less of a problem with you know, all of the, the baggage that comes with um, Trump being the standard bearer of the party. And so I wanted to write about that for a while, about how that, you know, like I have this thing, I talked about it here before. I really think that like the best strategy for um, saving the Republican party, I'm, I, I have a theory. I'm not saying I, it may be unworkable. I haven't looked into it as much as I'd like to. I think about it a lot. I have this theory that the way to save the Republican Party is, um, you know, I hate primaries. Done that chapter and verse a million times. I think primaries were a mistake. I think they're distorting the process. You're basically getting like nine or 10% of the electorate determining what each of the major parties does and thinks, which is crazy. Um, and, you know, when you, when you factor in the fact that the, 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 the hardcore base of primary voters are often the people who actually hate their own party. They just hate the other party more. Um, that's a really dysfunctional way of thinking about things and about how to run a party. So, you know, for those and a thousand other reasons, I would love to get rid of primaries. I am not going to win that fight anytime soon. So if you're going to take it as a given that primary, we're stuck with these dumb things um, and that we can't make them, you know, put aside the, first past, I mean, the jungle primary rank choice voting stuff for a second. Um, if, if we can't solve the problem of primaries with, with real concrete reforms, um, you, if you can't get the parties to take their obligations and responsibilities seriously, um, if you can't deal with the problem of small donors, which I think have made, you know, everything worse. Um, so you're just stuck with this thing. seems to me that the way to in the short term, the best strategy is to just have a massive get out the vote campaign that's not candidate specific of for normal people, right? If, if, if you take the broad brushstrokes analysis that I'm providing as, as directionally true, obviously there's a lot of fine print, right? But if you, if you think that it is true that, um, there are a lot of Republicans that are so disgusted. There are a lot of conservative-minded right-of-center people that don't want to vote for Democrats, that don't want to vote for progressives, that think like the primary system for the Democratic Party is almost as negative an impact on Democratic policy as the primary system is on the Republican Party. And so they feel homeless, right? But uh, they would love to vote for a Mitch Daniels or a Mitt Romney or... Um, even at this stage right now, you know, I'm Ron DeSantis, you know, I mean, I would not, I, I, I think Ron DeSantis is, is not having a great time right now, but you know, if it meant moving the party away from Donald Trump, I'd vote for Ron DeSantis in a heartbeat. Um, and this is not disputing any of the criticisms necessarily that, um, have been leveled against the guy. Um, I got plenty of criticism of the guy. So anyway, if you think that it is true that, in fact, that the people who are who are showing up in these polls saying, you know, 80, 90 percent of the party defend Trump or 
or that, you know, um, 40% of the party um, or 30% of the party um, will only vote for Trump. If you, if you believe all that stuff is true, just directionally true, I don't, I'm not going to get into a thing about the numbers, then what you need to do is bring in more normals, you know, and have a massive get out the vote campaign, particularly in early primary states for, um, you know, I mean, I understand it would be more effective if you could get out the vote and say, everybody vote for Nikki Haley or Tim Scott or Ron DeSantis, right? That would be the better way to beat Trump. But doing that would make the effort seem campaign driven, partisan, um, anti-Trump, all that kind of stuff. Um, it would trigger all sorts of antibody response from the other responses from the other campaigns and all that kind of stuff. And it would also narrow the number of people you could pull in and the amount of money you could raise for the project. So if instead you just said, you know, look, Republicans who think there's a better way, who think your party's been hijacked by crazy people and, you know, trolls, um, show up. Just show up. I don't care who you vote for. Just show up. And just by definition, just sort of by the math, the more normals you have in the Republican primary electorate, as a share of the Republican primary electorate, the crazies are smaller. And I'm not saying it'll necessarily stop Donald Trump, but it would get um, a lot of the normals more engaged in the party. And instead what's happened is the normals increasingly are fleeing the party. They're certainly fleeing the party apparatus. So that was in my head for a while. I wanted to write that column for a while. And then Michelle Cottle, I knew a bit back in the day, um, wrote a... Uh, really interesting piece for the New York Times about um, what's going on with the Georgia Republican Party. And I thought it was like just the perfect peg for this larger point that I was trying to make. And, and it was reading that piece that made me realize, ah, the Republican Party is becoming a giant comment section. Um, because I had not really focused on this, but Brian Kemp, he's not, you know, he's a Republican and he's definitely a conservative. Um, but he has got almost nothing to do with the actual Georgia State Republican Party at this point. The governor of Georgia, the attorney general of Georgia, the secretary of state of Georgia, the insurance commissioner, which is a big job apparently in Georgia. Um, none of these guys are going to speak or appear at the Republican State Convention in Georgia next month, which is like, if you remember what the before times are like, that's weird. and. The reason for it is that partly because um, I can't remember what his name is, but some Trumpist uh, bandersnatch was put in charge of the state Republican Party. And again, in violation of a lot of the expectations of the before times, um, he backed, he put the state party behind uh, challengers to Republican incumbents in the state. Right. I mean, again, remember the, the, the job of the Republican Party is to help Republicans get elected, to protect elect Republicans who have already been elected, and to get more voters to vote for Republicans than vote for Democrats. I mean, there are a couple other things that Republican Party is for, but that's, you know, that's the, that, those are the balls and strikes, you know, the bunting um, and running of, of, of a party. And, um, but the Trumpists think, you know, like if you're not Trump, Trump enough, um, uh, you're part of the establishment and you got to go. And so Brian Kemp and those guys are just like done with this garbage. And they ask people not to give money to the Republican party. They ask people to give money to like Kemp's leadership pack and all that kind of thing, because the state party has basically been taken over by the trolls. And this is happening, you know, once you start looking for it, this is happening in a lot of states. It's happening in Michigan. It's happening in Arizona, clearly, right? I mean, like, they basically um, chased Doug Ducey out of politics, at least for a while, um, because Doug Ducey had the outrageous effrontery to be decent and highly competent and honest, um, which just has no place in Carrie Lake's Republican Party right now. And Carrie Lake is a troll, right? Um and, uh, I mean, she just, I just saw this clip yesterday. She was telling Hungarian TV and don't get me started on CPAC going to Hungary right now. Um, just the 
most grotesque dereliction of any fiduciary responsibility of a conservative organization I have ever seen is how badly um, CPAC is being run. And, um, you know, I, I think Heritage is not far behind. Anyway, that's a conversation for another day and you know where I come down on a lot of that stuff. But, um, yeah, not so Carol Lake was saying the other day, you know, that COVID was released by the globalists to keep Donald Trump from getting reelected. Um, and, you know, that's comment section, that's Twitter troll nonsense. And um, it just sort of seems to me that uh, the, the, this is what happens, right? I mean, this is like, you know, when you go back and, you, you know, you look at the slouching towards Bethlehem, you know, poem, you know, the, the center doesn't hold the best lacked all conviction and the worst are filled with passion and intensity. I keep thinking about that all the time now because the people who are most engaged in politics right now um, are disproportionately fools, grifters, jackasses, dupes, um, and crazies. Um, and no, that doesn't mean I'm talking about you, you know, because by the law of large numbers, there are a lot of decent, wonderful, normal people. We call them typically dispatch, dis, uh, dispatch subscribers who are engaged with politics um, and enthusiastic, about po or enthusiastic, um, engaged with politics. Um, but if you just look about who's getting the attention, who's sort of commandeering the conversation, you know, it's, it's, it's people like Steven Crowder and Candace Owens and Tucker, right? And, and you know, you know, Tucker is, you know, the, the dashboard saint of sort of the trollification of the Republican Party right now. And the more these people come in, the more the normals are like, yeah, this is just not a club I want to be part of. And, um, and so anyway, I was, I apologize in advance. I may write about this today. It's been in my head since I wrote the column on Monday, um, it dawned on me that um, the perfect, I shouldn't say the perfect, the most enjoyable Goldbergian um, metaphor for this dynamic about policing comment sections and content moderation and all of that is clearly, and, and really I would say indisputably, that classic of American cinema, Roadhouse. Now, for those of you who have not seen Roadhouse, let me just sort of, you know, uh, recap briefly. Patrick Swayze is part of a, one of the most honorable guilds in effect, a brotherhood, if you will, um, like the Knights of Malta, who are called coolers. And what do coolers do? Coolers cool out people who are causing trouble in bars. And Patrick Swayze, who basically walks the earth like Kane, although he does drive a Mercedes, um, uh, goes from town to town, much like Kane, right? Uh, much like Bill Bixby in The Incredible Hope. And he helps, or, you know, uh, Michael Landon in, uh, what was it? Uh, Heaven Sent Us? Well, it was where he played that angel, right? This is a common trope of a lot of, TV shows, um, uh, even The Fugitive, right? But anyway, so uh, Patrick Swayze, Swayze um, goes from town to town, from bar to bar, cleaning up messes like a marshal of yore. And, um, and what's the whole premise behind this? Well, the premise is, is that if you let the troublemakers, the drug dealers, the pickpockets, um, you know, the all the guys who like Harvey Corman might've mentioned in his, uh, I'm sorry, Slim Pickens might've mentioned when he was explaining a number seven in Blazing Saddles, you know, the rustlers, the thieves, the, the pocket, the pickpockets, all these guys, right. Who come riding into town, whooping in a womp and stomping and whatever, raping the cattle and killing the women. Um, if you let those kinds of people have their way in your bar, in your saloon, then, um, the decent folk will stop coming and the indecent and more indecent folk will start arriving. You know, if you, if you, um, let the hell's angels come in and have a good time a couple nights, it might 
you might have no choice but letting the place eventually become a biker bar. And so Patrick Swayze, Dalton, uh, his job is content moderation, right? In the, in the meat space, in the real world, he comes in and explains that such tomfoolery is no longer allowed in this place um, and clears out the troublemakers in the riffraff and makes it the kind of place that, you know, you want to bring your first date on. And um, this has been stuck in my head all week, and I don't know what to do with it. I started to write a G-file on, on Wednesday, just one extended metaphor about it. And I was like, eh, I can't do this because I just wrote this column about it. And like, it's just, it's just a metaphor. But I knew I couldn't use it in the LA Times version of it. Um, so I want you to noodle that for me. Oh, so anyway, I, yeah, on the in the G file I wrote about crime, I also talked about it a bit on the a bit, bit on the Dispatch podcast um, yesterday when I wasn't. I don't know. I, I hope it worked out in the recording of the thing because I did not know that um, I would be getting. So one of the reasons why all this week was all so hectic was that on Wednesday. Uh, my wife had all of these appointments, doctor's appointments, all these things to do before she left for Europe. Um, so I was stuck at home having to sort of do, try to get this review of the Dean book done, try to get the G file done, record these podcasts, do all of this stuff. Um, at the same time, um, we've been waiting for 14 months. I, I, I defecate you negatory 14 months to get a replacement fridge delivered. We haven't had ice in our kitchen in six months. And, um, uh, and it all came together this week. And so on Wednesday I had to be around for this, um, uh, thing to be, uh, delivered. And then on Thursday I had to be around to have this, uh, thing installed because they're two different things and yada, yada, yada. And, and they also have the old one taken away. And of course, 10 minutes into recording the dispatch um, podcast yesterday, I get the call saying the installers are here. Um, and on Wednesday I was recording a podcast with um, Elizabeth Nolan Brown from reason magazine. We'll, we'll air that next week. And I had to just get up in the middle of the podcast for 10 minutes and go deal with all this kind of stuff. But I had to keep going back and forth yesterday during the dispatch podcast. So I don't know if you can hear me like getting up or like, I didn't hear some of the answers from my colleagues about the topics, but I did talk a little bit about the, the G file on crime. And, um, um, I, I, I've been interested in the crime stuff for a really long time. It was one of these issues that I worked on for Ben Wattenberg when I first came to Washington. Um, I put together all the data for his chapters on crime. And um, I've been interested in the debates about incarceration for a very long time. Um, if you listen to the last time we had a criminologist on here, and I guess we need another one, um, you might've noticed that I actually knew some of the literature a little bit, although you know I don't visit it all the time these days. Um, but I used to spend a lot of time in the BJS reports and the UCR reports and all these kinds of things. Anyways, so I find some of the argument now really, the kind of some of the debate now really tiresome and annoying um, because I think all the criticisms pointed left and right have some merit, but they also just sort of miss the point. And, you know, and again, I got into this a little bit with, with on the podcast, but um I think it's absolutely true that basically since the Trump American carnage stuff, when it was really BS, Fox and a lot of right wing media has been over hyping, selectively hyping crime um, in a way that scares people. And um, having gone through, you know, having to sit and be bathed in high decibel levels of Fox for the last three or four years of my mom's life and having talked to a lot of people about it, I think it had a real psychological toll on a lot of older people in particular. And so some of it was irresponsible, but some of it is just sort of like, if it bleeds, it leads has been part of American journalism for a really long time. And crime is a legitimate thing to cover. Now you can cover it sensationally or you can cover it responsibly or a mix of the two. So 
again, I'm all fine with people criticizing Fox and all this kind of stuff, but that, even if you stipulate 95% of that stuff, um, that doesn't mean that all of these left-wing and mainstream writers who are saying that, you know, it's a myth that crime is a problem aren't wrong too. It's, first of all, it's not a myth. Like there are in some cities, uh, things like carjacking, like in DC, carjacking is, is through the roof and it's happening in all sorts of, you know, safe neighborhoods. And I think about this a lot because my daughter drives now and it's happening in neighborhoods where I would not warn her not to drive. I'm not trying to traffic in some sort of, you know, coded stuff about certain neighborhoods, but I have zero problem and zero worries about being accused of being racist, having grown up in a crime written city and uh, being a father and saying that there are some neighborhoods that are scarier than others, that are worse than others. And um, if that bothers people, so be it. But um, there are neighborhoods that you would not think carjacking would happen. And it's happening quite a lot in D.C. Um, and I love the people who say, you know, you know, most crimes not up. Yes, yeah, your murder is up. OK, well, yeah, murder you know, is a thing that people worry about. Um, but also it's this. You know, I didn't think about it until just now, but like, you know, there's this thing in D.C. arguments about the budget that in the deficit and debt that is infuriating where, um, you know, like Biden claims that he's this doing this massive deficit reduction because he's spending less than he was. We were a couple of years ago. And this is like th this became a big debate starting with with Obama about ex what, what critics will call expanding the baseline, right? Is if you boost the baseline spending in one year, say you spend an extra trillion dollars for sake of argument. Um, and it's all borrowed money, remember, right? So we were borrowing a trillion dollars for some emergency. The next year, if you only spend, i.e. borrow and spend $500 billion dollars, you get to tell the New York Times and ABC News that um, you cut spending, right? You know, it's sort of like if you spend more than you have one month by $1,000 and the next month you spend more than you have by $500, it's not quite fiscal responsibility. But the way we talk about, you know, budget increases, the way we, you know, we, we uh, in Washington, uh, we to show you how dorky I am. Um, back in my days when I worked for Ben Wattenberg and was a TV producer, we had this internal acronym. I guess Ben came up with it called Detroit. And we used to mock and make fun of ourselves for using it. But it's, it's, it's an acronym D-I-T-R-O-I. -I. So we give it a little Frenchy kind of sound, Detroit. Um, and it stands for decline in the rate of increase. All of these various um, interests in terms of always spending more money, expanding government, um, they call, um, if you're spending, uh, if growth, if spending is growing at 10% at a year, and then you cut growth to 5% a year, people call that a spending cut in this town. When instead, it's just simply a decline in the rate of increase of spending. It's not an actual cut. And so anyway, the reason I bring this up is that there's this whole detroit approach to the way we talk about crime as if, you know, if there were a, if, if there were a thousand rapes last year and only 500 this year, um, I, I get why, you know, cops would say that's a kind of progress, right? Statistically speaking, but who thinks that's actually like acceptable? Like there's not, there's no acceptable number of rapes, right? There's no acceptable number of murders. Um, now as a cold hearted calculation, you can be open, you can realize that you're never going to stop every murder until we finally get that office of pre-crime up. But um, like all murders are a problem. And the way people talk about the, the way, because this has become a, sort of a left wing media criticism story, um, the idea that like politicians shouldn't focus on crime, 
um, because there's less crime now than there was. There's less murder now than there was in 1990 is crazy talk to me. It's like, so it can't become a real problem until the number of murders is greater than it was in 1990, which was, I believe, the high watermark of homicides in New York. Um, is that really the sort of argument? It's the job of government before almost anything else to protect people. That's what it does. That's what it's for. That's why people form governments. And this is sort of Lockean theory. This is classical theory. It's like, you know, either to protect people from foreign armies or from crime, right? I mean, it's just, that's what the government's for. And um, the way the press doesn't want and the Democrats don't want crime to be an issue, I think is shot through with a lot of bad faith because the, 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 Part of it is, is that there's a big part, ideological core of the Democratic Party, big part of this bubble that um, thinks that focusing on crime detracts from social justice, detracts from, you know, the helping professions, from social work, from root causes and all these sorts of things. And... Um, and it's like, it's a domestic version of guns and butter, right? They don't like defense spending at the, at, for foreign policy, and they don't like uh, law enforcement spending for domestic policy. And I get it. I am totally open to the idea that if we could find people, mental health counselors, who could deal with a lot of homeless people and mentally ill people better than cops can, go ahead and do that. I don't give a rat's ass, you know? I don't want people getting beaten up and killed if... Um, if there are people who can handle those kinds of situations better, that's great. But at the end of the day, there is no like amount of acceptable crime. Um, there might be amount of crime that you're just going to eventually have to deal with. But um, the way there's a sort of this, this just sort of smug, you know, dismissal of these issues. And I think it's in part because they think they help Trump and they help Republicans. Um, and what bothers me simply about it is that the way you stop it from helping Trump and Republicans is to do something about crime. And the weird thing about this is that this is something that Joe Biden did in the 1990s. Now I, I covered and read up and knew a lot about the crime bills, you know, the federal crime bills in the 1990s. And there was a lot of BS in it. Um, you know, like, Biden would, because um, he was the one of the primary authors of it in the Senate and, you know, it was a Clinton thing, you know, they would brag about how they created like 37 new death penalties. But, you know, the federal government, crime is primarily not a federal government issue. And so like a lot of these death penalties were like killing a postman on a federal pier and that kind of stuff. It was, you know, there's a lot of symbolic stuff in it. A lot of stuff about midnight basketball and all that too. But at the very least, what Democrats did in the 1990s is they, they signaled very clearly that caring about crime is legitimate, that it's not a distraction, that it's not boob bait, that it's not paranoia, right? Because at the end of the day, normal people, a lot of the stuff that the government does, they couldn't give a rat's ass about. One of the things that most normal people, left, right, center, care about is stopping people from, from stealing their stuff and harming their families or killing them. It's just a thing that people care about. They're weird like that. And this idea, it's like everybody spent way too much freaking time in, um, in college seminars where they bring this literary interpretation to everything and everything's got to be racially coded and code switch and this and that, you know, and it's like, I don't care what the skin color is of people who murder people is. I care that people shouldn't murder people. And, um, but there is this, just this idea that, you know, if you tell people you take crime seriously, you're giving permission to the worst people to take crime seriously. And my view is you should just, Take crime seriously because it's what the government is freaking for. And that's why the, the sort of defund the police stuff was so incredibly stupid. I mean, ask a normal person, uh, by which I mean someone who is not, you know, uh, social justice studies professor at Fresno State 
and ask them, like, what do you want to see your local tax dollars or your federal tax dollars going to? They're going to say some version of, like, police. Like, if you actually list the government functions that, that, that in front of them and say, okay, what, are you, what here do you think should just go to save money and save you taxes? They're going to scratch out a lot of crap before they ever say, oh, yeah, and get rid of the cops. And yet we have this national conversation, this very literary, academic, eggheady conversation that is incredibly and profoundly and ass-achingly stupid um, that seems to think that we can talk our way out of the core, what the core functions of government are supposed to be. And you have all these people instead who say we want the government to be transformative and do all these things. And now we got a whole transformative BS caucus on the right, too, with all the nationalism and post-liberal imperialism, whatever nonsense. And, um, and like, it's this huge argument between two sides about, you know, how much, you know, how much meaning the government can give you rather than just like, hey, let's do the job. Like, let's just do your job. And if you could do your job successfully, right? If you were like really great about fighting crime and collecting garbage and running hospitals affordably and filling potholes and, um, you know, take your pick about the dozen or so other things that people think government is supposed to do, nice playgrounds, you know, whatever. If everybody was really, really good at that, like taking care of mentally ill homeless people so they're not dropping deuces in the middle of the street or in a kid's playground, right? If you could do that stuff, take care of that stuff, right? Then I'd listen to you about these transformative things that you want to do to the society, these really ambitious, you know, next level um, uh, projects that you have that are going to provide meaning and all. I'd still be very skeptical, but, you know, prove you can do the job right first before you tell me that, um, I can trust the government and you in particular, who's, you know, falling down on the job, um, to do all of these grandiose things and, and give me a sense of meaning and belonging and solidarity and, and all the rest. Take care of that stuff. Do your job. Just do your friggin' job. Everything else will sort of fall into place. Anyway, I'm sorry. I, I've gone long. I think I'm going to ask Adam to trim some of the early administrative state stuff because um, I was just trying to get started. I don't have the emotional or physical energy right now to talk about the event for my mom, but I am, I am so incredibly grateful to everybody who came. It was, I think it was a lovely event. I couldn't, you know, I had to give these, uh, I had to say something obviously. And, um, um, I couldn't do it from a written piece of paper. So I wrote out this thing beforehand and then I didn't, didn't read from it. Um, because it was just, it's very unnatural and I, I don't like reading text and in front of large groups of people, uh, maybe I'll put it in a G file or something like that. The only thing I did read was, um, at the end of it, I was talking about, you know, how much my mom loved my daughter, Lucy, and, um, how much Lucy really loved my mom. And I gave an example. Um, this is the central quote or one of the two central quotes from my daughter's high school senior yearbook page, um, which is, you know, got pictures of her when she's a little kid. It's got pictures of her cat. It's got pictures of her in a bikini, which I am not in love with all that kind of stuff. But she says, uh, she quotes my mom and the quote is, when I was 14, I stole my mother's car and hit this kid on a bike. God, the freedom. So that's who my mom was. I, you know, she, I don't, she didn't kill the kid or anything like that. And she's got, when she found out <laughs> my daughter was actually quoting that on her yearbook page, she kind of came up with, you know, uh, revisions to the story a little bit, but uh, it's basically true. And it's definitely the way my mom would talk. When I was 14 years old, I stole my mother's car and hit this kid on a bike. God, the freedom. So with that, um, thank you all for listening. Please check out the, um, the very special exclusive panel Remnant Live that we did with me and Steve and Chris Starwalt. Um, 
Um, I'm not even mad that people are saying that Chris was funnier than I was because I think they're probably right. Um, but it was a really good time. A lot of people got a lot out of it. The full thing is up on the Dispatch Live um, feed at at the at the dispatch.com. The first 40 minutes you may have listened to on the podcast, but you can only listen to the full thing by becoming um, a member of the Remnant. I'm sorry, you're already a member of the Remnant by listening to this podcast, by becoming a member of the Dispatch. Uh, you can subscribe for a month trial, you know, give it a shot. If you don't like it, unsubscribe or let it lapse. That's fine. I mean, I'd rather you didn't, but, um, uh, and just so you know, there's just going to be more and more of this kind of thing. We are running a business here. We want more people to become subscribers. Um, we think we provide a really good product in, um, at a time when the, the, when the, not just the right, but the country needs more honest, non-crazy journalism. Um, you know, we got a lot of left of center uh, subscribers because they appreciate the fact, even though, you know, some of them hate me in the comment section apparently, but um, they appreciate, you know, that we're trying to do stuff in good faith, um, that we care about facts, that we care about honesty, that we care about not just trying to make people mad. And, um, and we got some fantastic newsletters that you can only get if you're a member. Um, and we're going to have more podcasts and stuff that are going to be behind uh, the subscriber wall. So give it a shot today. I really don't think you'll regret it. Um, I know I'll appreciate it. And uh, with that, I'll talk to you next time. <laughs>